Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 428 for Tuesday, the 1st of December, 2015. Indeed. So nice to have you here. Say hello to Jeff. Hi. Also, Adam is around here. He's up in camera. Hey, Adam. And Tally's over there. She's working on uh, building some things for her new show. The Pixel. The What is it called? The too busy drinking a pot. <laughs> the Pixel Shadow is coming soon. She's over there building arenas to show off Mind Test, mind test mods. Right. Yeah. I've got to play a little uh, around a little bit more with that. It looks pretty cool. It's going to be fun. I like that. All right. Well, tonight we're going to continue our 20 weeks of GIMP. Uh, if you watched last week, you'd know that Robbie kept freezing his screen with... Uh, hey, now. Play nice. Well, all right. I'm not going to completely throw you on the bus, but we're, we're going to fix his issues. Uh, we're you. showing you some shortcuts. <laughs> I didn't know we were getting into therapy. Here <laughs> also, I've got a Raspberry Pi 2 here. We're going to turn nice. this little bad boy into a web server. Yes. So don't go anywhere. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hillary Rumble. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. Jeff! How are you, man? I'm good, and you? Good, man. Good, good. Do you uh, want to know what's going on in the news? Do I ever? <laughs> All right, some teasers for you. All right, here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Udemy is under fire for being used uh, as an online marketplace for pirated educational courses. Also, a brand new design for Amazon's delivery drone has been unveiled. Raspberry Pi, seems to be the topic of the night, has unveiled the new Pi Zero. And it's about half the size of the regular Raspberry Pi microcomputer and costs just $5. Oh, come on. I know, it's a good deal. Dell's service tag IDs can easily be compromised by a web attacker. Newcomers to Canada are going to stay connected through uh, Win Mobile's plan to give them some phones and service absolutely free uh, for the Syrian refugees. And kids in the UK, get ready for it. We're talking about Christmas. They're going to be able to see Santa flying by on Christmas Eve. So stick around. Full details are coming up later in the show. Very cool. And, and now the chat room's going wild and saying, oh, the Raspberry Pi 2, that's the big one. <laughs> Come on now. It's not my fault that they went and released one that's half the size. This is only the size of like a credit card. That's, that's huge. Remember when, <laughs> remember when computers actually took up desk space? Desk space? What about an entire room? You could, you could stick, yeah. You could like <laughs> double-sided carpet tape this to the back of your monitor. And it's got everything you need. So, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to call it huge. <laughs> but the Pi Zero, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool that they that's very exciting. are making it even more streamlined. Now, of course, the Pi 2 has things like, uh, I'm not sure what, uh, what the Pi Zero is missing, but I think Ethernet. Uh, maybe a couple yeah, of USB I, I ports. Don't, or, I don't think it had that, yeah. Um, so, so there are advantages to getting the big one, <laughs> the size of a credit card. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the Pi 2 and what we're going to be doing in just a little bit. Now, I've got the teeny drone here charging. And, hey, I want to say thanks to everybody who's been supporting Category 5 TV yes, thus huge. far through Patreon. We want to send you not one, but two teeny Woo! drones. Whoa! I'll get control yet. <laughs> <laughs> I want to send you two of these so that you can race a friend or whatever you want to do, right? Uh, charge one while you're flying the other. See, that's, <laughs> that's how I meant to take off. Uh, you don't drive there. a car like that, do you? <laughs> I kind of do. <laughs> yeah. um, and in order to qualify to get one of these, go over to patreon.com slash category five. Sorry, not one, but two. And... Uh, what we're going to be doing is the first 100 people to contribute as little as 25 cents per episode to Category 5 TV, you're going to qualify for that draw to get two teeny drones so with the exciting. remotes. 
yeah. So just a little thanks for uh, for those who are supporting us. And looking at Patreon this week, we're really starting to, to gain some momentum here. Uh, Patreon is a fundraising platform that helps us to raise money to keep Category 5 going. And if you go to Category, uh, pardon me, patreon.com slash Category 5, don't worry about what's after the the question mark there, but just category five. It's going to take you to this page and it lets you give. Now it defaults to $1. If you scroll down a little ways, you'll see some information about us, what we do, and pledge as little as just 25 cents. And for those who are doing that so far, it makes such a difference. And we appreciate that. Now, Category 5, we're volunteers here at the show. Uh, the space that we're in is a rental space. Mm-hmm. We have a, a beautiful studio here in Barrie, Ontario. And we love that we've got space for, um, for audience members to come and sit in yep. and enjoy the show. We offer that to the community absolutely free. Uh, we do product reviews absolutely free. Um, companies send us stuff and we present it to you so that you've got a chance to see some cool stuff. And it's also a great platform for companies to be able to, uh, to promote promote and, and to share uh, unbiased reviews of their products, too. Absolutely. We keep it real around here. Um, so with Category 5 being free, there comes a point when, okay, we do have to pay rent, and that's where Patreon comes in, and uh, you can learn more about how to support us through that platform, patreon.com slash Category 5, with our humongous thanks for all your support. Uh, another way people are supporting us this month, Jeff, are, uh, is by uh, doing their Christmas shopping through our partner pages. Right. That's pretty cool. You can get on over to any of our websites. Uh, so that's Category 5 Technology TV, The Show Show, uh, New Every Day. Uh, but if you go over to any of those and click on for, uh, for partners, let me just really, really quick you, uh, quickly show you such a cool way to support Category 5 TV and our network of shows because a portion of every sale goes to supporting Category 5 TV. I showed mm-hmm. this, this uh, ratchet belt yes, that I, yeah. I'm wearing again today. I'm actually on the last ratchet, man. The ratchet belt? The ratchet it, belt. Uh, really? I'm on, I'm on the last ratchet of my ratchet belt. It doesn't go any further. That's, wow. that's a great feeling. But I showed this on the air. And uh, a whole bunch of you have, have been buying it. And we get a cut every time that you, you, you do that through our links. So you go to one of our websites. Let's bring one up. I'll go through neweveryday.tv, click on partners, and you'll see on that website. So here's what we got. I mean, we've got Amazon for all the different regions around the world. Uh, we've got um, royalty-free music. We've got Dollar Shave Club if you need some good razors to get rid of that Movember uh, mustache you've got going oh, there's on. There's some nasty Movember <laughs> still kicking around. <laughs> Might as well go to Dollar Shave Club and support Category 5 at the same time. Design a shirt. We've got So you scroll down, and there's all these great companies. We've also got... Uh, the Irish Store, they're our newest uh, partner. They are offering 10% off all gifts. If you'd like to get some authentic Irish gifts uh, to fulfill uh, some of those needs on your Christmas list, for example, then that's a, a great way to shop. So by clicking on those links, Amazon's a perfect example, and you've been doing it, and I appreciate that. Uh, a portion of those sales come back to Category 5, and that helps us to keep the lights on, yep. keep the show going. And we've got some cool stuff going on. We're, uh, you'll see that we've got the hand cam today. Mm-hmm. We've got a couple of new devices to play with. We've got the Raspberry Pi. We've got a new Magewell Pro 4 HDMI 1080p capture card in yep. the server, which is brilliant. Now, we, you know that I love Magewell cards. I've been working with uh, Blackmagic Intensity cards for years. That's mm-hmm. what we started off on. And uh, then I tried the Aver Media cards, yep. and they were, they were actually a little better when it came to odd resolutions. Um, <clears throat> but they had the, the, a couple of little issues and, and things like that. But I'd say that the Aver Media probably worked a bit better than the BMI stuff. But then I was looking for something that would do 4K, and that's where Magewell came in. Right. And Magewell has the 4K capture card, which is the one we were using. Now we're using the 1080p, but it has four inputs. So oh, it lets wow. us hook up to four cameras and what do you notice about about this card can i show you sure can absolutely take, so this is a magewell card no signal right okay well what happens when i turn on the camera hey we, we're looking at you i've got and me i've got signal <laughs> right so that may not mean a lot to you but i'm gonna turn off the power now okay Oh, it, 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 I don't know if you could hear the, the shutter close, but there it is. It's gone. So it goes into no signal mode. Right. We did not blue screen. Which is nice. 
with HDMI not being a hot swappable medium with the Blackmagic intensity cards as a broadcaster, and we're, we're going to talk about all this on the show show.tv, but with the Blackmagic cards, you'll crash your server. Your, your, your broadcast computer will just crash really? blue screen if you're on Windows. Ooh. So with, the, uh, with these Magewell cards, it doesn't crash your system. That's nice. So, much, so basically, it becomes hot swappable to the point, I mean, if somebody ever tripped over an HDMI cable and it was plugged into a Blackmagic intensity, you'd be very lucky if your system keeps running. Yikes. You so. don't want that for a show. No, definitely want reliability. Um, so we also notice one of the other things that we notice, um, and I ran a test just before the show, uh, before putting in the new Magewell card. Um, I wanted to see the difference in CPU usage, yep. and I was hovering around forty-eight to fifty-one percent CPU usage. Now we've got five HDMI inputs now on this system, and okay. if I switch over to Wirecast here. Uh, let's see if I can bring this down so that you can see it. Do you see up at the top right there our CPU usage just to the left of that those uh, little green bars at the very far right is uh, sitting down around 43 to 46 percent. Okay. So it's rather substantial the uh, the CPU savings as well. Um, it's working really well so far. So we'll see how it goes tonight. Nice. It's a bit of an experiment, but cool. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Lots of fun stuff. Yeah. All right. Should we talk about the GIMP? Yes. Let's uh, now. Last week, you know, I was talking about um, the GNU image manipulation program yep. on week one of our twenty weeks of GIMP tips. This is a wonderful series that we're doing because GIMP has given us twenty years of the GNU image manipulation program. The developers have given it to us for free. It's a great replacement for Adobe Photoshop, and it's absolutely free to download, use. You can use it on your work computer. You can use mm -hmm. it at home. You can use it on all of the above. And we were talking about uh, last week how we we're we we're on 2.8, and yep. th we were, I think, 2.8.16 or something like that last week. Now, on Friday, they released 2.9.2. Right. So 2.9 is officially here. We're working our way toward version 3, and 3.2 is where things get really exciting for me because of the non-destructive editing. So what does that mean? Yes. What does that mean, Robbie? What does it mean? <laughs> when you are working with a raster image... Um, say you've got a picture and you add an effect to that picture. Yep. Now, yeah, with GIMP you can do undo and go back, but you can't, you can't um, put a drop shadow and then um, do a blur and then add some text and then do. And, right. and if if you render it, then you can't go back to that layer. The right. you know the drop shadow. Okay. So with non-destructive editing, it's kind of like, let's call it like uh, Adobe Photoshop's layers filters. Right. Okay. So you can apply filters to layers that you can then turn off. Right. Think about text drop shadows. A great example is text. If I create text in GIMP right now and add a drop shadow, it creates a rasterized drop shadow. Okay. So that is basically a graphic of that text as a shadow. So then if I then go and change the shadow, I'll fix that for you, don't worry. Cool. Um, if I go and change the shadow, mm -hmm. or sorry, the text, the shadow stays the same because it's basically an image right. based okay. on the original text. So with non-destructive, the assumption would be that I can change the text and the drop shadow would change along with it. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's theoretically what could be done if they decide to right. implement that particular feature, but that's how non-destructive editing works and you you always have kind of your master files okay what else have we got okay first of all the first development release of 2.9.x the series <laughs> is out so you can get it at gimp.org in the release uh this is the press release on the website alexander uh, Pro, uh prokudin uh who he helps maintain the uh the website yes at gimp.org yep. uh says here's a quote it is another major milestone toward making GIMP a state-of-the-art image editing application for graphic designers, photographers, illustrators, and scientists. See, that's exciting to me, because I remember when you first introduced me to GIMP, that was 15 years ago. Wow. 
It was a long time That's ago. Nuts, eh? And at the time, my wife was a photographer. And yeah, so right. we, we tried to use it for some photo editing, and she just wasn't a huge fan of it compared to Photoshop. But I mean, that's going back 15 years I ago. I think users of Photoshop, Anthony, we sat down with him uh, a few weeks ago. Yes. And he was here in the studio. We went out afterward for a bite mm-hmm. and had a chat about Photoshop versus GIMP. Yep. One of the things that concerned Anthony about GIMP is keyboard shortcuts. Yes. I've memorized all the keyboard shortcuts in Photoshop, and this <laughs> yeah. is what happened to me last week. I hit yeah. Control-Alt-L to get my levels to and instead I'm on Linux, so it locks my screen. So tonight we're going to learn how to control that, how to fix that, okay? So I think that's what makes it hard for any Photoshop user yes, to switch to over do that to transition. Yeah. is that things are not where you expect them to be. Right. Yeah. It's like getting into a new car. I, I got into my boss's car the other day, and I, I didn't know where the wiper blades were to, to turn on the wipers because <laughs> yeah. everything was different from my van. Yes. So it's just so you got to familiarize yourself, and then once you've familiarized yourself, it's it all makes sense and it's practical. So, all right, so. looking back at GIMP 2.9.2, let's look at some key features here. Kay. Okay, it has Geggle Image Processing Engine. That's the uh, uh, I guess it stands for Generic Graphics Library. Okay, Geggle. Gaggle, G E G L. Um, that means that the tools in GIMP are now not just 16 bit and 8 bit, but also 32 bit. So you've got much more color space mm-hmm. to work with. You've got it's the color, um, uh, the channel processing, the color channel processing is so much better with right. GIMP 2.9 series. Uh, and that's just going to get better and better as they implement more and more Gaggle support. Okay. Um, okay, upcoming GIMP 2.10 is going to use Gaggle for pretty much everything under the hood. Uh, 2.9.2 is the very first technical preview release on its way toward 2.10. Uh, so this is what they're working toward. Uh, a few advanced features of Gaggle, such as non-destructive editing, are planned to be exposed in the later development 3.x, 3.2 most likely, right. okay. and onwards. Uh, but with this version that's out right now, you can already benefit from some of the the uh, aspects of this tool, such as, as I mentioned, 32-bit processing. Mm-hmm. You've got basic OpenXR support, so uh, different file format that does right. HDR imagery. Right. Uh, on-canvas previewing for many of your filters, so you don't have to actually render your filter. It will preview uh, right oh, okay. on the screen as you're, as you're doing it. So nice. That helps. Um, experimental hardware accelerated rendering and processing via OpenCL. So that's going to accelerate based on the quality of your graphic card. If you've got a, a good uh, a good graphic card, it's going to help utilize the uh, like say the CUDA cores of your Quadro card and make it so that the the rendering process is very very fast. Cool. Take it off of the CPU basically. Uh, and of course, this I'm excited about, and this is right now they have improved downscaling in GIMP. Really? One, yeah, and that's one of the things I think where Photoshop has a real stronghold over GIMP yes. is in downscaling. Yes. What that means is when I take an image like this and I shrink it down to a smaller size, with GIMP, previous versions, so 2.8 and before, um, you tend, to, if you've got an eye for it, you will notice a bit of a lossiness. Yes. You're losing quality during that downscale operation, which really shouldn't be the case. If I was upscaling, then I would expect it stretched, and so I'm going to get some pixelation. But if I'm downscaling, I really expect I'm compressing the information into a smaller space. I should be getting better quality, if anything. Yeah. So uh, that's something that they've improved, so I'm excited about that because that is going to push it one step further uh, toward being a a 100% replacement for Photoshop for me. I that's exciting. That's really the big thing that's holding me on Photoshop in a virtual machine on my other screen. Right. Sometimes I go back and forth. Usually I use the GIMP. Uh, GIMP has the advantages of better uh, tracing around images, mm-hmm. uh, better ability to use a marquee and, and, and then adjust your marquee after you've already created it. So GIMP nails it on that. Right. Uh, but scaling was always a, de- uh, a bit of a detriment to the quality of it. So I'll save something as a ping from GIMP. Yes. Move after removing the background, go over to Photoshop, rescale it, save it, and then reopen it in GIMP. Uh, That's my too many steps. process, right? So uh, sometimes I'll use Mogrify from Image Magic to do my scaling because that does a pretty good job in the Linux uh, c- uh, terminal. So, anyways, uh, additionally, native support for Ping, TIFF, PSD, and FITS files in GIMP has been upgraded. Uh, so they will now read 16 bit and 32 bit 
image files. Okay. Um, so that's good. And I believe there's some writing as well going on, exporting abilities. 2.9.2 uh, introduces a couple of new tools, implements many improvements over the, the past version. And uh, it's got better lightness control. As I mentioned, the color is a lot better. And the final thing that I'm excited about, I think, with 2.9.2 is WebP image format. Which okay. is the one that I, I believe it was Google that introduced it and said, okay, JPEG, of all things, is too, um, is too costly as far as space on the web. They found, right. a, they found a way to make images of the same quality be 20 to 30% smaller in size. Right. And even with transparent, and we, we use pings to have an alpha channel so that we can have it transparent. Right. Um, and uh, they, they, with WebP, you can create an image that's transparent, but it's much, much smaller than a ping. And the quality is the same. And there are both lossy and lossless versions of WebP files. So, so it's exciting to see some WebP um, support coming into GIMP. Good. Now, for anybody who has GIMP, is it a whole new download or is it just a update? Yeah, 2.9.2 is uh, going to be a new download. So you can uninstall the old version, install the new, and you'll be good to go. Now, if you're on Linux, however, once your, um, your distribution releases it in the repositories, you can do, an, uh, for example, on a Debian-based system, apt-get space upgrade. Okay. And it will upgrade everything. Oh, perfect. Um, so it's a little bit different. Um, but as far as if you're on Windows or Mac, I believe the process would be to reinstall right. the new version. You're going to download it. You can get it for free. It's gimp.org. Click on download, and uh, you'll be able to get that. Cool. Can we take a look at what we're doing tonight? Yes. Do you want me to get you into the chat room here? Yeah, I'm sure. As well. I don't know what I did. I messed I up your book. I think screensaver came on. Oh. You probably hit Control-Alt-L, which is a big <laughs> problem for me. <laughs> it sounds like I it. tend to do perfect. that. Here you go. All right. WebP uh, for the chat room is one word. So W-E-B-P, that's the file extension. So check it out. Uh, there are some examples Google has provided, and it's awesome. It's really awesome. I'm excited about WebP. Uh, so that's cool. All right. So as I was kind of hinting at and uh, kind of having fun with, it, is that when I hit Control-Alt-L on my Linux system, let's do it. Here I am on Linux. I hit Control-Alt-L. What does it do? Bop. Oh, Locks your screen. I'm on Linux. <laughs> and I continually do that. Uh, I feel for Anthony, who's, on, who's trying to get onto Linux, but it just, you know, the keyboard shortcuts on GIMP drive him nuts. Right. So the first thing I want to look at is the fact that there are some resources that are already there. Okay. Um, and let's bring it up for you. So there are previously set up shortcuts that are available for you. Uh, if you go to, I think it's GIMP user. Is it GIMP user? I've written it down. Somewhere in here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there it is. GIMPusers.com dot com slash GIMP. GIMP slash hot slash keys. Hot keys. Yes. <laughs> GIMPusers.com slash GIMP.hotkeys. There's a rather comprehensive uh, tutorial here. Uh, not even a tutorial, just a list. Oh, look at that. It's not all of them, but it's kind of the most, most used. Yep. Uh, these will work on Linux and probably on Windows as well. Now, Mac, you're going to need the, uh, I guess, the, the, what do you call that? The Mac key? What is it? Command key. Yes, command That's what it's key. Yeah. Instead of the control. Right. Um, so you'll see that everything's there um, as far as shortcuts go. But wow, what's that's the a one? Lot. Yeah. What's the one that I'm having trouble with, Jeff? <laughs> control Alt L. <laughs> levels. In Photoshop, that brings up my levels dialog. Yes. GIMP has the tool, but I'm constantly hitting the wrong keys. So what I would do here is I would say, okay, if I'm looking for it, I would hit Control F in my browser and type levels. And I find that, oh, there is no default key, according to this, for levels. I can see that, you know, layers, sure, there's yeah, the control layers L. dialog, Control L. Um, so you can actually bring up the layers dialog if it's closed by hitting Control L. That's cool. So if there is no default, how do, I, uh, how do I do it? Well, let's go into GIMP. Let's bring it up. Now, I'm still on 2.8 uh, because my distribution has not uh, brought me, pardon me, 2.9 yet. Right. <laughs> it was only released on Friday, guys. <laughs> All right. So here I am in GIMP. And when I click on Control-Alt-L, what I want to have happen is bring up my levels dialog. Not sure if I can do that without a canvas. Let's create a canvas here. Uh, colors. Levels. There you go. So a couple of clicks to get there. I have to right-click, go Colors, 
go levels, and then I'm there because there is no hotkey. Right. So to fix this, we're going to go edit preferences. And then you'll see interface on the left-hand side here. Let's click on that. Yep. And what we need to do here is turn on use dynamic keyboard shortcuts. Once okay. we've done that, we can click on configure keyboard shortcuts and you'll see a list. These are the, the available commands that you can assign to keyboard. Now, would they uh, overwrite the commands that are already there? That depends. Okay. If, if it's a GIMP command, then yeah, it will it will then set the other one I believe to disabled. Oh, okay, and you have to reassign. However, in our case, Control Alt L is not a, a GIMP command at all, right. and that's probably intentional because they know Control Alt L on Linux is lock, lock your, your screen. screen. So we can't change that from within the GIMP as far as the behavior of that. But I'm right. going to show you how we can make this work in the GIMP. Okay. Okay. So here I am in this dialog. I'm going to go. I'm just going to actually search because it's a little bit quicker and type in levels. And there I am, levels. So if I single click and then hit Control Alt L, you'll notice it didn't lock my screen this time. Instead, it set the hotkey to Control Alt L for levels. It's set to save keyboard shortcuts on exit. If you make a mistake, you can uncheck that before you close. I'm going to close and then hit OK. And now Control Alt L is going to lock my screen. That's it. I've assigned it. What have I done? What have you done, Robbie? Now, okay, that's not going to be the case if you're on Windows, if you're on Mac. Right. It's uh, only Linux. Unless Mac has, well, it's, is it Command-Alt-L? I don't know. You, I don't know. I generally avoid my wife's Mac. Yeah. So, <laughs> I can't stand so it. on Windows, this is not going to be the case. But on Linux, because Control-Alt-L is overridden by the operating system as the lock screen, we need to then say, okay, you know what? We're, we're going to change that. So now, forgetting about GIMP, now that we have already set that up in GIMP, I want to go System, Preferences, and I've got Keyboard Shortcuts. Now, it's going to be different on your distro. I like to use the old school kind of interface, so I'm on Mate. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a GNOME 2 fork, and I'm running a, a, a distribution called Point Linux. And so for me, it's in the old place, Preferences, uh, under system, and then keyboard shortcuts. So look around for keyboard shortcuts in your distro. You're going to find it. It's there. If, n if not, go into settings and configuration and all that kind of stuff. You're going to find it. So now here, I'm going to scroll down and find the one that says lock screen. There it is. It's also set to control alt L. The interface is similar. If I single click, it's going to ask me for a new shortcut. Easiest thing to do is just add the shift to the mix. So shift control alt L now becomes my lock screen key. Okay. And if I close this dialog and go back to GIMP, so here I am in GIMP, Control Alt L, color levels. Oh, I must have chosen the wrong levels dialog. <laughs> but <laughs> the point is it works. It worked. So, okay, go back into preferences. Let's go back to our interface and change levels. Let's turn that one off. I hit backspace to delete it. There's another one called levels up here. That's kind of a, a trickery, eh? Indeed. So my new accelerator, control alt L. So you see what has happened there? There's two plugins called levels. Watch out for that, all right? So I've chosen the one here, levels up there. Let's see if that's the one. Okay. Oh, and if you see it, the name there, it said uh, the color levels for the one no, that you that's chose. the same thing. It's still giving me the same thing. Let's see. Interface. Configure keyboard shortcuts. Levels. Do you think it's the tools levels? I'll bet you it is. This is a plugin. Okay, backspace to delete. There's another one. <laughs> and it has an icon. Look at that, Robbie. It has a nice fancy icon that looks like your levels. So that's probably the one. So guys, gals, look under tools-levels. You'll see tools, levels. <laughs> All right, let's close it and watch. It's going to bring up color levels, isn't it? Control-Alt-L. There, there we go. go. Third time's a charm. Make sure you pick the right one from the dialogue. <laughs> but hey, I think I've effectively demonstrated that it's easy to change. Absolutely. So there you go. We've had to set the hotkey on GIMP, mm -hmm. and we have uh, set a different hotkey for lock our screen on our Linux distribution. Again, that step is not necessary if you're not on Linux, but that right. helps us get around it. So now Control-Alt-L will work on Photoshop when I'm in Photoshop, and it'll work in GIMP.
So you can go through all of those commands that you've already memorized for your other program. Uh, you can go through, work through, and re reprogram uh, GIMP to operate in much the same way. You're going to find that the tools that are available to you are pretty similar, if yep. not pretty much the same. It's just making the interface work for you. There you have it. Cool. It's exciting. Thanks for watching. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and we are in uh, on the second week of our 20 weeks of GIMP tips. And these are just quick little tips for you that we post on linuxtechshow.com. Make sure you subscribe. Right down there, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a subscribe button, a like button, and uh, the thumbs up. Give us a thumbs up. And uh, also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, everybody. All right. All right. I think it's time for you to take over with the news. We've got a new uh, news set tonight. We're going to see how this works out. Yeah. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and thanks for joining us tonight, folks. You'll find us online at www.category5.tv. Ready to take it away, Jeff? Uh, I think so. All right. Oh, look at that. Fancy graphic. Ooh. Wow. I feel all uh, special. Wow, look at you. Okay. Uh, you Udemy? No, <laughs> you demand. <laughs> All right. uh, Udemy is under fire for being used as an online marketplace for pirated educational uh, courses. A brand new design for Amazon's delivery drone has been unveiled. It's very cool. Uh, Raspberry Pi has also unveiled the new Pi Zero. Talking about that a little bit earlier. That's about half the size of the regular Raspberry Pi uh, microcomputer, and it costs just five bucks. Dell service tag IDs can easily be compromised by a web attacker. Newcomers to Canada, they're going to be able to stay connected. And we're talking about the Syrian refugees that are coming in via Wind Mobile, who's going to provide them with free phones and service so they can uh, connect with loved ones over here. And kids in the UK, they're going to be able to see Santa on Christmas Eve. That's what's coming up. You've got mad skills. Now hone them. Learn new skills or improve your existing ones with online video tutorials and training from lynda.com through our special link at cat5.tv slash lynda. Learn software, technology, creative, and business skills that you can use today to help you achieve your professional goals. Join today and start learning. We'll give you this chance to try it absolutely free with unlimited access to all of the courses. Sign up now for free, cat5.tv slash linda. I'm Jeff Weston filling in for Sasha Dermatis, and here are the top stories from the Category 5.tv newsroom. Udemy, a platform for experts to sell educational courses, has been accused of not doing enough to remove stolen content from its servers. The site allows people to upload training materials and then charge Udemy users, which are more than 7 million, that's a lot, for access. But several experts and academics have expressed anger at finding that their courses have been uploaded to the site and offered for sale without their permission. Udemy, which raised $65 million, or 43.3 million pounds, in investment in June this year, responded by saying that it relies on users flagging copyright infringement contact, or content. However, to report instances of copyright infringement, users must first join Udemy. A separate support email can be used by non-members, but this method of reporting content is not publicized clearly on the website. As far-fetched as it sounds, the era of drones delivering packages is about to begin, according to Amazon. On Sunday, the company released a new ad on YouTube showing controversial British TV host Jeremy Clarkson praising the benefits of Amazon's still-in-development drone delivery service, Amazon Prime Air. That's along with the new hybrid drone design, which can switch between vertical and horizontal flight. And a quote, in miracles of modern technologies, Clarkson says as the ad cuts to scenes of father and a mother using an Amazon Kindle Fire tablet to place an order for their daughter's new soccer shoes using the new Amazon Prime Air button, which promises delivery in 30 minutes or less. It's almost like pizza delivery service. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. The new Amazon delivery drone rises vertically like a helicopter to nearly 400 feet before switching to hor uh, horizontal flight orientation. It's streamlined and fast, like an airplane. Now, the altitude is no coincidence as it's what the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration says is the upper limit for hobby aircraft, including drones. 
The new delivery drone can fly for 15 miles straight, has automatic sense and avoid systems, and will be the first in a whole family of Amazon drones with different designs and different environments. Raspberry Pi, topic of the night, has just unveiled the Pi Zero, a programmable computer that costs only $5. The Pi Zero is the charity organization's smallest computer, and it packs enough power and components to match up to their other offerings in the Pi family. In fact, it's half the size of the Model A Plus released last year, but offers twice the power. The Raspberry Pi Zero boasts a Broadcom BCM2835 application processor, that's 40% faster than the Raspberry Pi 1, and 512 megabytes of RAM. There's also a micro SD slot, a mini HDMI socket for video out output at full HD resolution and 60 frames a second, and a micro USB socket for data and power. And that makes it perfect for electronic projects uh, that require small components. Raspberry Pi's founder, Eben Upton, said that the organization worked to develop a low-cost computer to remove the barriers that kept people from learning about programming and tinkering with electronics. Good luck getting yours, though. The Raspberry Pi Zero sold out almost immediately after launch. But don't worry, more are going to be available soon. Yesterday, it was revealed that Dell systems are vulnerable out of the box to an attack that could help phishing uh, scammers compromise a system. Dell is shipping PCs that come pre-configured with digital certificates that make it easy for attackers to cryptographically impersonate any website on the internet. In addition to this frightening fact, now a researcher has shown that Dell computers can be surreptitiously forced to reveal the service ID number Dell, users, Dell uses to identify customers. The unique Dell service tag can be used to fingerprint users even when they turn on the private browsing mode of their favorite browser, delete all their other cookies, or any other steps that they take of blocking their... Uh, trackability. The ID can also be entered into this Dell web page to obtain warranty information. So fraudulent computer services, which claim to be from Microsoft or other well-known companies in an attempt to gain control of the target's machine, can also use the identifier to make the ruse more convincing. Dell Foundation Services is an official Dell application designed to make it easier for customers to get technical support. If you're running it, your system is vulnerable. If you'd like to test your system, you can use a tool found at rol.im front slash Dell. Wind and Mobile says that they're teaming up with a local group to assist Syrian refugee families in their tra transition to life in Canada with free cell phones and service. In a news release, the mobile carrier says Haya Mobile uh, and Lifeline Syria are helping with the initiative that aims to make the transition process a smoother one for newcomers to Canada. Lifeline Syria has played an active role in the relocation efforts, and the nonprofit organization says that they're hoping to bring in 1,000 refugees into the Greater Toronto Area with help from private sponsors. On Wynn's website, the wireless provider says they're committing to providing the basic necessity of mobile communication to incoming refugee families embarking on a new life here in Canada. The other company involved, Hyla, is a Texas-based business dedicated to extending the life of mobile phones. It's unclear whether the phones will be made available to refugees that are going to be made available to refugees will be new or if they'll be refurbished. And on Christmas Eve, there will be a strange object in the sky that could easily be mistaken for Santa's sleigh. It's not Rudolph, but NASA has confirmed that the International Space Station will be passing over the UK on Christmas Eve. This means that if you look closely, you might be able to see a foreign object in the sky. The International Space Station is the largest man-made object in the sky, weighing in at around 100,000 pounds, which is the equivalent of about 32 cars, sorry, 320 cars, and measuring 357 feet end-to-end. -end. Because it reflects light from the sun, it can look like a giant star or perhaps a sleigh as it passes by. Virtual astronomers have worked, uh, worked out that this year the International Space Station will pass over the UK in the late afternoon, rising in the west at 4.42 p.m., passing low in the sky and setting in the southeast at 4.50 p.m. They said on Twitter, when the International Space Station passes over, it will appear as an incredibly bright star-like object or plane without flashing lights moving across the sky. It can at times be the brightest object in the night sky, second to the moon. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us. If you found a news story you'd like to send, email it to newsroom at category5.tv. For all your tech news with a slight Linux bias, visit the category5.tv newsroom. For the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Jeff Weston, filling in for Sasha Dermatis.
Thanks, Jeff. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. www.category5.tv is where you'll find us. Jeff, thinking about the phones that Wind has given to uh, refugees yes. to come into Canada. And you mentioned not sure if they're going to be refurbs or new phones. Right. I, it made me think um, how we live in a society that is upgrading All every couple the of years time. anyways. Yeah. I think the stats are like 90% of cell phone users are upgrading every two years. Well, yeah, and now that we've got the new contract length at two years, as that's imposed true, by CRTC, eh? that's what you do. The Canadian Radio Telecommunications Commission, Commission or something, something I don't like know. that. So they're the people that the governing body over right, cellular yeah. and radio communications and things. Um, so they actually have said that the, you have to renew two years. Yeah, they've said that uh, contracts can be no longer than two years. Um, and that the price of the phones are rolled in, and mm. I mean there was so a bunch e of stuff. even even a two year old phone though is going to be uh, a pretty decent. You, uh, no, I, I've switched over some phones after yeah. two three years. It's amazing how does, obsolete does tech change they are. Or is it just oh, it's nuts. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. I remember going from the iPhone 3GS. My wife got the 4S. <sighs> I know iPhones planned and obsolescence. It was it was nuts. It, right? It was crazy. And now that I've switched over to an Android phone, I'm like, okay. It's, it's a <laughs> Finally, freedom. This <laughs> is like awesome. It's and such. true. But man, is that a polarizing <laughs> topic. Yeah. I had one person <laughs> unfriend me from Facebook over it. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah? What do you mean iPhones suck? Yeah. Their response was, I can't talk to you anymore. We just lost 30% of our viewers because I said, I was kidding. <laughs> iPhones are great. Oh, great. I just lost 70% of our viewers. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Ready to look at some pie? Yes. Raspberry Pi 2 is the one that we're looking at tonight. Uh, we've already been doing some, some builds. We did a, uh, uh, a multimedia music server. That's um, the one that Sasha was working on? Yeah, that's the one yep. Sasha was working on. It's installed at an office now. Um, so the case for our kit is actually at their office it, okay. with, with that unit. So I've just picked up a replacement circuit board for the Pi 2 so that we can continue doing other stuff. But things like, okay, now I need a power supply because the kit is now gone and, and so on and so forth. So it was an opportunity for me to look at some other gear mm -hmm. and say, hey, wh what else can we do with the Raspberry Pi? Tonight, we're going to be building a web server. Nice. Looking at the specs of a Raspberry Pi 2, this has got a quad-core CPU. Okay. It's got one gig of built-in RAM. It's got uh, a micro SD slot, so if you need a lot of space, you can stick a lot of space in there with a micro SD uh, card. Mm -hmm. Perfectly fine. It's got four USB ports, full-sized HDMI output if you want to hook it up to a monitor display. It's got stereo music output, audio output. It's got component video output. And I'm just reading from the back here and so on and so forth. It's got all this stuff. It's got everything you need. Okay, so it's powered by USB. It's not really that big, folks. No. I know the Ras Raspberry Pi Zero is out now and it's half the size, but that's it. That's, so that's little. That's the whole computer. And you've got, so we've got Ethernet here, four USB ports. We've got HDMI output for video. And we've got the micro SD right here. So that's the card that, uh, oh, you're going to get the extreme close-ups? Oh, the extreme oh, close-ups. Look at that. Uh, we've got Ooh. micro SD right there. Okay. Uh, we've got, uh, what do we got, GPIO if we want to start doing some really cool stuff. You'll see Sasha actually put some heat sinks on this. These come from the kit that you can get at cat5.tv slash pi. This so is do the heat sinks come on it automatically by default? The heat sinks do not. So these okay. are just uh, like chips. Okay. Uh, but the, um, the kit that we sell at cat5.tv slash pi include the heat sinks. Okay. As well as the circuit board and everything else that you need to get started. So... Uh, so that's really all that we, you know, we don't need to go into in depth about the uh, the circuit board and everything like that. But tonight, what we're going to do is, uh, because we're going to be building this into a web server, we want to look at a couple of different things. First of all, how are we going to power it? It's USB powered. I wanted to find a creative way to power this thing. Make sure you bump your mouse so that you don't go to sleep again on on us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, I, I wanted a creative way to power this thing in, in such a way that, hey, I can add an external hard drive and power right. that at the same time. I can power a monitor. And so that's where I came up with this thing. Okay. And we have these at uh, in the shop as well, cat5.tv slash pi. 
what this is, cyber power, uh, they make uh, UPSs, power units, surge suppressors, that kind of stuff. This is strictly, it's built for charging your devices. Right. It's perfect for the Pi because it gives you two USB ports, and each of those ports have 2.1 amps of power. It's okay. also got a, 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 an AC. Now, this is uh, like American-Canadian um, power, so 110, 120 right. volt kind of thing. Yep. Um, there may be something available for you in the UK as well. Can I show you this one, Adam? This is actually hooked up. So there it is. So the other nice thing, what I really, really love about this, and Jeff, you may be able to get a better view of this, is that it has a power switch. So oh, we nice. Can, we can actually turn on and off the power to all of the ports. So okay. USB, both of them, plus the electricity uh, all at once. So we'll use this for, say, a, a computer display that we're going to hook up to the Pi if we wanted to do that. We've got a USB to power the, uh, the Pi itself, and then we've got a USB additionally to use for either charging a device or maybe we want to, as I say, uh, connect an external hard drive, which is one of the things that we're going to be doing. Okay. All right. Now, so, one question about that. Is yeah. it strict, the USB, are they strictly for power or are they for, yeah. so not for data transfer or anything? The USB on the side here, yep. this is power. So the micro USB. Right. Now, these full-size USB um, sockets, these are for plugging in peripherals. Right. That could be flash drives. That could be printers. That could be webcams. That could be, um, in our case, a USB hard drive. But again, USB hard drives, USB 3, they need power. Right. So USB hard drives have two USB. One of them has blue, that's mm -hmm. data. One of them has white, that's power. Right. So in a case like that, we're not going to plug both of those into the Pi because then we're going to be drawing power from the Pi. Right. What we want to do is we want to get data from the Pi but get power from the power outlet. Right. Okay? And so that's we'll, where the two USBs come in handy. That's why. Oh, yeah, on that. Absolutely. Yeah. So one will be for the Pi. All right. So let's, let's hook all this up and see what, uh, what we need to do. Love this thing. Get it at cat5.tv slash pi, all right? Perfect little power adapter for this. So I've got just a power cord from my phone with the micro USB, and I can plug that right into, I don't know if you want to maybe, you know, get in, in there with the camera, and then we can show everybody right up close and personal. Here we go. That's just coming up. There. Okay, so this is the power port here. Okay. So we just plug that in. Yep. Okay. Then we also need Ethernet. So this is going to give us Internet access. Okay. So that's this guy here. And then HDMI is strictly so that if you want to have video output, which I only want to, to be able to show you what's coming up on the screen, uh, typically we can go headless, especially when it's a server. That just goes into the full-sized HDMI output port. Okay. And that's all there is to it. HDMI carries audio as well, so we don't need the, uh, the audio output jack. Uh, pretty straightforward. And then we've got the free USB ports. So right. now that that's like that, you'll notice there is no power switch on the Pi. Um, so we have the power switch that's actually built into this power unit. Okay. So as soon as I turn this on, it's going to start firing up. So should I, well, I can flip it. I'll flip the switch. I'm going to switch over our uh, signal to, uh, that's the Pi. That's the HDMI input on the Magewell card. I'm going to flip the power switch now. So now it's powered on. I can see two LEDs yep. uh, coming up. A little teeny and, LEDs yep, there. Yep, he's just uh, showing you there. So yep. that's fired up, and that's what's actually happening on the screen. So you'll see everything kind of whizzing by, and this is uh, telling us a little bit of information about um, what drivers are being loaded, what's happening. Connecting to DHCP on our network. It's got an IP address, uh, 192.168.0. 0 0.105. So that tells us how we can connect to it. So that's kind of a cheap and dirty way to find out your IP address of the Pi now that it's connected. Right. And if it doesn't get one, it means maybe you forgot to plug in Ethernet or something like that. So right. make sure you do that. So you don't need to have a monitor plugged in, but it helps the first time to get your IP address. But another way you could do it is log into your router, mm -hmm. check DHCP, see what's in your pool. That's, uh, you know, it assigns IP addresses at your router, and then you can uh, configure a reservation so that it always boots with the same IP address. Right. Okay. So if this one uh, lets us in, we're going to try SSH. Now, I could plug a keyboard and mouse into that, and I could just start working on it on the screen, um, but instead we're going to use SSH to remotely connect in so that I could do this with a headless server. It could be in a, okay. a closet somewhere or connected just down by the router, and I don't have to physically have access to it. Cool. 
So on my Linux computer, here I am. I'm going to jump into the terminal. So this is on the same network, so that's how I'm going to be able to SSH in. And in order to connect into that system, the Pi, I'm going to go SSH, and the IP address is 192.168.0.105, right? So it's on the default port, so we don't have to specify. And you'll notice that I'm logged in as Robbie on my system. So I have to actually use a user that's active on the Raspberry Pi. And that, out of the box, is Pi. Now, why is that? It has an operating system, right? Now, I've booted it up, and maybe I've skipped a step. We've put an operating system on the SD card called Raspbian. Okay. Okay. Uh, go back. Um, I jotted down the episode number here. Uh, if we go back to... 416. Episode... Yeah, 416, where we showed you how to install an operating system on the SD card of your Pi. Mm -hmm. Just really, really quickly so that you can get the same operating system that we're working with, uh, all you have to do bring up your web browser and go over to raspberrypi.org. Okay, click on downloads, click on Raspbian, which is basically Debian. It's just that it's uh, got the enhancements to, like the drivers to operate the Pi, so it's already working for you right. out of the box. And what we're using is Jesse Lite. Um, so what that is is um, the current stable version of Debian is called Jesse, and the light version means there is no desktop operating system. It is strictly a server. It's minimal. Okay. okay. If you want to use this as a computer, you can go with the full desktop image, and that will then give you a full kind of computer operating system. So that's the operating system, which we've downloaded for free, installed on the SD card as per episode number 416 or the instructions on the website, mm -hmm. raspberrypi.org. So we know, at this point, that Pi is ready to be connected to. So let's do it. So I've got SSH, Pi at 192.168. Blah, blah, blah. If it asks you for a secure certificate, you can just say yes. That's because your first time connecting, it's asking if you want to connect to that secure site. Uh, password is going to be Raspberry with a P, R-A-S-P. B-E-R-R-Y, uh, okay? And that is the default. You'll want to change that before this thing actually goes live and becomes an actual system. So let's try things like, let's find out a little bit more information about what's running that's really got nothing going on out of the box. Uh, our load is... Like Not even nothing. 1%. Yeah, load average is 0 0.04. See at the top there? Nothing really going on. Let's check things like um, free is our memory. We can do a free dash H for human readable. So used 66 megs of memory and it's got 859 megs free. So that's looking pretty darn good for uh, a quick and dirty little development web server. So we want to have what? Like Apache and uh, PHP MySQL or MariaDB and, uh, and make it happen. So right. we can host websites on this thing. We can develop websites on this thing. We can use uh, uh, SFTP to connect in and drop files. We can do whatever we like. So it's ready to go. It's up and running. And it really is Debian. I don't know what, you, what does your name tell us? Raspberry Pi. Linux Raspberry Pi 4.1. So they've named it that on ARM7. Looks good. So that's, it's, just, it's so simple to get this thing up and running. We can actually just start playing around. So what do we want to do because we're building a, a web server. Oh, thanks. How long was that up? A few seconds? Yeah. I must have hit the wrong button. <laughs> You're so excited about this. <laughs> I know. I really am. <laughs> this is awesome. Um, so with the Raspberry Pi, we've got to look at a few things when we're looking at this as a web server. First of all, what's our hard drive? Uh, if, you've been, if you've been following, you know that we're booted from a micro SD card. Right. Do you have any comments about the reliability of micro SD? Those of you who have been watching the show over, over time probably know my opinions of micro SD. I don't think I've ever used micro SD for a hard drive. Even SD, any, any kind of flash media like that that's built for a camera, it's really designed to be used for snapping pictures, plug it into your computer, right. copy them off, and it's going to crash one day. That's Let's right. hope it's not today. Yeah. Um, running your operating system off of the Pi on a micro SD, not the most reliable thing in the world if you're going to be doing it 24-7 as a web server. You're going to have people connecting to it if it goes public. 
and accessing files on that all the time. So reads and writes, reads and writes, right. and reads and writes. So the first thing that we can can consider is, okay, how can we then move some of those reads and writes off of the flash drive? And if you go back, uh, back in time a little bit to episode number... Trying to remember, did I write it down? It was a four fifteen. Four fifteen, right? Where I turned a laptop hard drive into an external hard drive. You okay. can buy an external hard drive. That's fine. But if you remember this, uh, this is just an external SATA hard drive, mm -hmm. and we've got a connection for USB two point zero, and we can make this happen now. We've got USB ports on the Pi. Yep. We've got a power unit that has an extra power port, so we're good to go. Let's do it. Cool. So. The first thing that you do with um, a USB-powered hard drive, USB 3, is you plug in these ends of the cables. Do not plug this end into the, into the hard drive first because if you add power first, it's going to spin up before there's data. And if you put data first, right. it's going to try to connect before there's power. And it's not necessarily going to cause a problem. It's probably smart enough, but I'd rather not take the risk. So I'm going to give it power. Yep. That's the white cable. And then I've got blue for uh, data. And I'm simply going to plug that into the Pi, being careful that I'm not touching any of the circuits or anything like that because I don't want to zap it or shock it. So now I've got power coming off of this power unit. I've got the data plugged into the Raspberry Pi. And let's just blow this up full screen here so that we can see what's going to happen. And if I go ls slash dev, I'm going to see a, a list of all the devices. So if I plug this in, theoretically, it's powered up, so that's good. Okay. Look at all the wires. I feel like such a hacker. <laughs> all we need is pizza and beer. That's right. Yeah. Back here now, if I run that command again, we should notice, look at that. We've got some extra stuff. And what is that extra stuff? Well, notice here on my first one, there is no SDA. So the hard drive was detected as SDA. That's my drive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I can mount that. If I go into slash whatever, I can... Let's see what the file system has. We've got media, so let's well, let's go into MNT, and let's make a folder called. I'm gonna zoom in for you, just in case you're watching this on a smaller screen. Uh, make a directory called external, and it says cannot create directory because I'm not super user. So I type sudo, and then now there's a directory called external. So now, sudo mount slash dev slash sda1 that's the first partition on the sda hard drive to external enter so now it's mounted that drive so that is now a hard drive if i go into it it says cannot open permission denied if i do sudo ls external i can see that the drive is there but if i type mount you'll see sda1 at the bottom there mm -hmm. It's NTFS, which I guess is fine, as long as it's read-write mode. That's good. And if, it's clean, if it was cleanly unmounted from the computer previously, then that's good. Nice thing about it being NTFS, I suppose, is that I can take it over to a Windows computer, copy files onto yes. or off of it. So if I decide to use this as a data drive and transfer things back and forth, it makes things kind of simple. Right. So I could leave it like that and add it to FS tab. And uh, that way it will automatically mount every time. But that just quickly demonstrates for us that, hey, that allows us to access it. So why can I, the, the Pi user, not access it? No permission. So let's try sudo umount external, which is unmount, basically, without the N. Uh, let's look at the permissions on that. It is owned by root, and it is uh, seven, I don't know. <laughs> sudo ch mod 777 external let's see what happens there uh, if I now mount that what I did is I just told it you know what let's give it full read write access to any user don't do that uh, nearly what do you call it don't do that um, without understanding it so now I want to unmount that Because that didn't work. Uh, good guy in the chat room saying 755. Was that 755? That's what he's saying. 
that's going to set it back to the way it was. Let's see. Oh, was it? Yeah, you were right. 755. So notice, okay, so what that means, if I look at the left there, DRWX means the owner of that has, uh, well, D means it's a directory. RWX means they have read, write, and execute permissions. And then after that, it says read-x. So read-execute means that I cannot write if I'm part of the group. And then read-x again means uh, somebody who's just anyone Nobody in particular, any user on the computer can only read and execute, but they can't write. Right. So if I, as super user, am I mounted right now? I'm not. Sudo mount dev sda1 to external. Now super user has access to it. So I can go sudo make dir external slash, um, and we'll call this web. Operation not permitted. Am I read right? I am. You know, can I just, can I be so bold as to say, let's just make it ext4? Sure. Can we do that? Yeah. Because we're working with an NTFS drive that is uh, formatted for Windows. And I'd rather, you know what, just eliminate the need for for windows drivers uh the the uh, ntfs stuff to be used so how i would do that is uh sudo make file system dot ext4 dev sda without the one because i'm actually formatting the oh yeah no i want to format the partition pardon me not the um not the hard drive the partition itself so sda1 do I want to proceed? It's going to wipe out the NTFS. Now, I know that it's blank. This is destructive, so you're going to actually delete everything that's on the hard drive. Right. Is that okay? In this case, yeah, I'm so okay with that. Make sure you check your drive first. Yeah, plug that into a Windows system and make absolutely sure. But what we're doing is we're converting it to a Linux drive, that, and it's already done. So now if I, let's look at my permissions again. We're 755, as we found on the folder called external. Let's try sudo mount dev sda1 to external and then if i do a mount you'll see that it is now ext4 is the type and it's read right. write let's see what happens i have read access i have the ability to go into it see if i have the ability to create a directory test i do not so sudo make dir web because this is going to be for web stuff and now you'll notice that i can't actually do anything within this folder because i don't have permission so if I now give permission as super user, chmod plus, uh, no, let's go 777 web, cd web. Now I should have the ability as pi to do stuff. Let's try it. I've just created a file called test, and I'm going to type test, test, test in the file and try to save it. Control O, file name, test, and it wrote it, no problem. If I do an ls you'll see that there is now a file in the folder called Cold test. test. And if I cat that, test, test, test. So ext4 is what we have went with. Uh, we've mounted it um, as root. We've then made a folder that any user has access to write to. Mm -hmm. So um, be careful with that. You may want to set up stronger permissions, but this is a right. development system. So I know what users are going to be accessing it. It's, inter it's internal on my LAN, and it's not over a wide area network. So now we've got a place that we can drop our files that as people access the Apache installation, which we're going to install, the website server, it's going to load them from that external hard drive as opposed to from the flash drive. Right, okay. As, as sessions are created, we can set sessions to automatically save to that drive as well. So we haven't moved the operating system at this point off onto an external hard drive. All we've done is said, okay, now we've got a place that we can mount. I could put that as my home folder if I wanted. I can, but what we're going to do is set our virtual host to point to that hard drive so that that hard drive in the web folder is the equivalent of var slash www. Right. Where the, the server is going to serve things up from. So we need to have a web server. Let's do it. We can do this from anywhere. Sudo apt get update. Whoa, if I could type right. <laughs> update, not udpate. <laughs> and it's going to work. It's just going to check the Raspberry Pi, Raspbian servers, and check for new versions of software, and uh, download those lists. So that's getting all those off the web. 
And then we're going to install what's called Apache. And Apache is a server software that basically rules the internet. Um, there are other server programs out there. Nginx mm -hmm. is one. Monkey's another. Um, IIS if you're on Windows. Uh, Apache is known to be reasonably fast and getting better. Garby and I had the discussion about how um, Apache is really getting up there as far as speed goes. And with the later releases that are coming out now, they've really they've basically doubled their performance. Um, so I'm really um, encouraged about the, the progress of Apache. So I'm going to be developing under Apache, so let's, uh, let's actually use that on our Raspberry Pi server. So now that I've updated the list with that command, sudo apt-get update, now we're going to go install, sudo apt-get install Apache 2, and then hit enter. And if it finds that package, which it does, it's going to say, okay, here's all the stuff that you need in addition to that. Are you sure you want to continue? Let's say yes. And so now, without having to find a disk, without having to do anything like that, we've, we've basically told it, hey, download Apache 2 off the web, install it, and get it running up on this computer. It's going right. to automatically activate it. And if all goes well, um, we're going to have a web server in a matter of moments, which is perfect because we're practically out of time. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is um, a, a non-graphics web server. This is That's it. I wanted okay. to use something that had no GUI. So we're right. doing this all from the terminal. This is Linux geekery at its best. Okay. Uh, I mean, look at all the wires. <laughs> that's true. Now, if somebody I, look used... Look the circuit board that's running the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody used uh, a visual interface as opposed to just going straight with the coding, yeah. does that change the way you do this, or is it all the same? You could use a package manager to yeah. install Apache. But to be honest, the reason that we want to go with um, just straight server, no desktop, no applications, first of all, when you install a desktop, um, which you can do, mm -hmm. it's going to come with desktop applications, a word right. processor, an email application, graphics engines, and drivers for your video card, stuff that's really not needed as right. overhead on a web server or on a server in general. So by not using those things, we're not creating we're not running anything that doesn't need to be run right so we're not creating overhead and and sort of slowing things down and or not utilizing our hardware efficiently so that's one of the considerations but also you know we can do everything this way from a headless unit like i said we can unplug that hdmi and put it in the closet somewhere and now i can access it through my network and program it away and get working on it and i don't have to worry about physically having access to it perfect so, no head Cool. Which means no monitor, no display. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's going through the list of things that it's installing, and it's done. So now we know the IP address of this server is 192.168.0.105, and if all went well, I should be able to bring up my web browser. I keep saying should be able to because <laughs> this is completely untested. 192.168.0.105, Apache running on Debian. Nice. There you go. Uh, it's up and running. We've got a web server. It is not yet pointed to this external hard drive. I'm going to halt that server just as we're wrapping up uh, at the end of the show here. I'm going to go back to my Pi, and I'm going to go sudo halt, which is a safe way to shut it down. Okay. And that's going to go through, and it's going to power the whole thing off, and we're going to lose connection. Um, one of the LEDs will remain lit up. That's fine. I think it's... There we go. Connection lost. Connection closed. So now if I go back to Apache, refresh, this is 192.168.0.105, you'll notice it's spinning its wheels and it's not going to go anywhere because the server is now powered off. Right. I've got this power switch, which I can now flip and we've got no signal. Awesome. That's all there is to it, folks. So we're going to play around with this over the next couple of weeks. Next week, Sasha Dermatis is going to be here. Now, nice. in order to have her here, I've explained in the past, um, we had to come up with a creative way to do it So yeah. because she works Tuesday nights now. So she's going to actually come in Saturday morning this week. We're going to pre-record Tuesday's show, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're going to have some fun. We're actually going to create a, a case for this Raspberry Pi ourselves that you can print on your home printer. What? Yeah. So that's happening next Tuesday night. We're recording it on Saturday, but you're going to see it next Tuesday night. Don't miss it. And uh, we're going to actually print a case for that Raspberry Pi, and we're going to distribute files to that's allow cool. you to do the same. So it'll work with the B Plus and the uh, 2 Series. We're regular just, we'll printer. Just, not, regular not, a, printer. not a 3D printer. Just a regular printer. Wow. That's it. That's exciting. It's going to be fun. So don't miss it, folks. And thank you so much for watching the show. Hope you had fun. Jeff? 
Thanks for being here, man. Oh, my pleasure. It's kind of neat. I'm, I'm excited. I'm I'm thinking of all the things I could use at home with this kind of stuff. We're going to have some fun with this, folks. I'm even going to let you connect to it so that you can wow. uh, see what uh, you know how well it performs. Because it is kind of interesting that we can build something that's going to take up so little space yeah. and operate like a web server. So that's neat. That's all there is to it. Well, thanks, folks. Have a great week. Don't forget to get on over to patreon.com slash category five. Show us your support this week. And uh, we'll talk to you next Tuesday night. Have a good one. See ya. We hope you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. 